Friends, please join me in welcoming Deep Nishar. Thank you, Raj, for that wonderfully generous and kind introduction. So it's, it's really an honor and privilege to be here. This is you know, one of the things that most of us have on our bucket list. In IIT lingo, when else can you give funda to the dadas who gave you fundas, right? <laughs> so this is the time when we get to do it. And I'm very honored to be here. What I want to be able to do today in the next 20 or 25 minutes is really share with you some of the observations and insights that I've had working over the last 20 years in amazing companies with extraordinary entrepreneurs. And I call this talk the seven learnings from building great web products. The reason for that is that most of the time, we spend our entire life building a profile like this. This is a professional profile, and clearly, this is very valuable for all of us. In fact, I worked at a company called LinkedIn that became a $30 billion company encouraging and enabling all of us to build these profiles on the web. Elizabeth Holmes this morning quoted the great Roman emperor and the founder of Stoicism, Marcus Aurelius. And Marcus Aurelius asked a very simple but a very profound question. He said, what is the purpose of our life? The purpose of our life is not to accumulate awards and degrees and amazing roles and responsibilities at great companies, but it is to really make an impact. And the kind of impact I'm talking about are products, services, offerings that we can build through our collective wisdom and our collective knowledge that impact the lives of hundreds of millions of people. These are products like the Google Map Maker. Why is this product important? You know, just like many of us, I came on the shores of this country almost 25 years ago. On 16th of August, 1990, I picked up my information packet at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, my orientation packet. And as I opened it, and I picked up the first page that was supposed to tell me where to go, my heart sank. I felt really, really dumb. And it's not that on the packet it said, only people who were JE number one can interpret this packet. But there was something there that I'd never seen before in my life. It was a digital map of the university campus. Now let's go back to the 90s. How did we get directions to go somewhere? At least in Bombay where I grew up, you'd go to the chokidar of a building and you say, boss, how do I go to this place? And he would say, well, you know, sort of go five or 10 minutes in this direction, and you'll see a panwal at the corner. There's always a panwal at the corner, because their job is to give us directions. And say, so then take a right, then you'll come to this sari shop, called Sarita Sari Shop or something, and then take a left there, and then ask somebody else. It worked for us. It worked for all of us for a really, really long time. But meanwhile, the Western world was already digitized. We had maps, people could read them, they could go from one place to another. And the reason we didn't have them in India or any other emerging markets is because it was extremely expensive to map each and every inch of our geographies. So many years later, when the Bangalore office for Google, we came up with this idea, we conceived it and we built it right there, a tool called Google Map Maker. What did that do? It took all the satellite imagery that we had. By then, we had acquired a company called Keyhole, took all of that Google Earth data, and then built tools that we open sourced, and we gave it to the broader community. We said, here are the tools. Here's the satellite imagery. Go find your neighborhoods. Go find your schools. Go find your cities and your towns, and start mapping. Start putting down the roads. Start putting down the schools. Start putting down the structures. The outcome was magical. Within hours, cities like Manila, Saigon, Lucknow, Lohar, Karachi were being mapped, and mapped to the level of detail that had never been seen before. Even governments did not have that level of detail. And today, hundreds of millions of people are able to use these tools, and pretty much the entire world, all the continents have been mapped, thanks to tools like Google Map Maker. 
This is the kind of impact I'm talking about. And in fact, I've made it my professional mission to build insanely brilliant, yet simple products that change people's lives. And I've been really fortunate to be able to do that with other amazing and extraordinary people in some of the best companies in this world. And what I want to do today is talk about the seven principles that we've derived on how we can do this at scale. How we can do what's not expected of us, as Vinod very aptly said earlier. The first and foremost principle is how do you know your user? When we build a product, we all know that we do customer research, we go and talk to a bunch of users, and we get that information back. And we try to build something that we believe they will use and that we can sell to them. But that's just the first step. That's not knowing the user the way we ought to know them. The best companies in the world, the most innovative companies in the world, the way they understand the user, all of that knowledge is permeated throughout the fabric of the company. If you go talk to their lawyers, their accountants, their marketing people, they know exactly who their users are. It is used in every material they use, every word that they print, including the annual reports that mostly nobody reads. What I have here are pictures from companies, four companies and four annual reports. And shout out if you know what those companies are. Top left, Harley Davidson, that's correct. The quintessential biker dude. Top right. Virgin, right? The hipster bar come nightclub that you can see on the sky in their planes. Bottom right, it's from FIFA World Cup. Yeah, I heard Nike, it's exactly right. Bottom left, Target. Focused on the young middle to upper middle class mother who really cares about her family and they want to permeate whatever they need in their lives. We could all come up, even though we may not be using these products. Very few people here probably have Harley Davidson's. I didn't see anyone in leather gear, right? But we all knew who that brand was and what they think about. That's what knowing your user means. But it's not just about marketing fluff. It can help you create winning products. Take, for example, what we built at Google, at LinkedIn, sorry. LinkedIn is a professional use case, which means that if you map how the users are using the service, typically you will see that the usage starting at about eight or nine in the morning, continuing throughout the day, and then ebbing around five or six in the evening. This is the desktop use case. Then we looked at the data and said, how would people use this on the iPad when it first came out in circa 2011, 2012? And we saw a completely different use case. We saw a bimodal distribution starting at about six or seven in the morning, then going down at nine, and then coming back again at about seven in the evening. Why was that the case? As we looked into it, what we found that most people use their iPads right next to their bedside table or in their living rooms. They weren't bringing that to work. So the first thing they did when they woke up was they checked the iPad and they used LinkedIn and in the evening, once they were done with dinner, they're sitting on the couch, maybe watching TV, they were looking at the iPads again. This knowledge of really understanding what the users were doing led us to build the iPad app for LinkedIn in 2012, which was completely different than anything LinkedIn had ever done before. It looked like this. It had two key components. The first one was a calendar. Why your calendar? Well, what do we do the first thing in the morning as professionals? We want to know what our schedule is like. Who are we meeting? What are we going to do that day? And the second important component was all the professional news. We want to quickly scan what happened in our fields that morning or at the end of the day, things that we may have missed. These two components together and understanding of the user and what they were doing with the iPad app and LinkedIn together led us to build an app that within three weeks, three weeks, became the number one iOS app on the iPad across every single category. That's how you really take your user insights and translate that into something very meaningful and very valuable. The second principle is that simple is a feature. Da Vinci once said that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, and he was very profoundly true in doing that. 
because complexity can actually be harmful. This picture here is that of a control room at Chernobyl, one of the worst disasters in human history. I had the opportunity to be in Ukraine a couple of years ago, and I wanted to go visit Chernobyl 30 years after the disaster happened. And the locals said, don't do that. They still have radioactive fallout. Now, there were many contributing factors to that disaster, but one key one was the fact that look at how the control room has been designed. Look at all those panels and dials. How many operators do you believe are needed to pay attention to each one of them and make sure that the important ones were not turning yellow or red? The average human brain can keep only seven things in our head at any given point in time. There are hundreds of these dials there. No one had a chance, not a single chance, of figuring out if a disaster was about to happen with that kind of a design. We see this in everyday life, too. Think about something we use almost every day, the word processor. Microsoft Word came out in 1984 with 40 features. You could format documents, you could share them, you could save them, you could print them. Pretty good, huh? Many of us, including myself, I wrote my IIT honors thesis on that in 1990. It worked just fine. But no one wakes up, unfortunately, every morning and says, product's good enough. It works for our users. Let's not mess with it. No. In 20 years since, the engineers and product people at Microsoft continue to build CRUD upon CRUD. We ended with 1,500 features, 35 distinctive toolbars, including one toolbar just for Japanese salutations. I now work for a Japanese company, so I'm learning a little bit of Japanese. But I really don't think there are 20 different ways of saying kozaimas and sayonara. But that's what they did. And because they built so much, guess what had to happen the next year? We got the Clippy. Remember the Clippy? We loved it so much that on the internet, we created Usenet groups called all.clippy.die.die.die because we hated it so much. We didn't want someone to tell us how to use a simple product like a word processor. And guess what? Microsoft's competitors were not sitting still either. Google bought a company and launched Google Docs with a very simple premise. We build documents so we can collaborate and we can share. And they build that functionality really well. Apple, on the other hand, build Apple Pages, because they said, you're doing it as a publishing mechanism, and we want you to build beautiful, artistic presentations. That's how Apple Pages was born. Meanwhile, Microsoft continued to do their research, and they found that 80% of all the features that the users wanted were already embedded in the product. We just couldn't find them, because they were layered in those 35 toolbars and the 1,500 features and someone coming home every night saying, look at all the cool shit I did this night. Not thinking about the user, not thinking of simplicity as a feature. The third principle is to embrace constraints. None of us are ever happy with the amount of time, money, or resources we have to build the things that we want to build. And yet, constraints can be really sweet. My wife and I are huge Bollywood fans. We love watching Bollywood movies. And so we become romantics. In the early 90s, when we were young, younger, I should say, at least in my wife's case, the place we would all fantasize about was Switzerland, right? I mean, who doesn't know the Shah Rukh Khan and Kajol cavorting around in Switzerland and Dilwale Dulhaniya Le Jayenge and becoming like best buddies for life? And we wanted to go to Switzerland for a honeymoon. But unfortunately, both of us were newly minted graduate students. We didn't have enough money to go then. But over the years, I always had the secret desire to go there and take her with me. And you know, after I'd sold enough Google and LinkedIn stock to scrape together a little bit of money, we decided to take a vacation to Switzerland a few years ago. And we are both good Jews, and we love, we have a sweet tooth, so we love sweets. But we really fell in love with Swiss chocolate. And in particular, one kind of Swiss chocolate, which was hazelnut. Now, hazelnut chocolate, as I dug into it, because I'm a very curious person, I want to know everything about things that I love. 
As I dug into it, I found out that it was not actually an original flavor that the Swiss used to have from centuries ago. It came about somewhere in the 1600s when Napoleon decided that he wanted to conquer Switzerland but couldn't really do it because of guerrilla warfare tactics from the Swiss. And so he did what we would call in modern day an embargo. He put his armies all around Switzerland to stop the flow of goods and services in and out of the country. And the Swiss chocolatiers started feeling a shortage of the key ingredients they needed to make chocolate. So what did they do? They embraced that constraint. And they started using fillers, such as hazelnut. Today, hazelnut-flavored Swiss chocolate is the number one exported chocolate out of Switzerland. It can be pretty beneficial to embrace the constraints we have. The same thing happened in the mid-2000s when mobile devices came out. Lots of companies, the approach they took was very simple. They said, we have this amazing product, all the feature and functionality that people love on their desktop and their 23-inch screens. Let's just squish it down to a two-inch screen or a three-inch screen. But that is never the right approach. The companies that rethought what the screen could give you and thought about what the users would use it for, the quick, in the moment, do a certain task quickly, they were the ones who built the best apps in those times. The London Tube app is a great example of that. This is prior to the iPhone era, when you couldn't really build very sophisticated app. They built a J2ME app where all you did was you said, this is where I am, this is where I want to be. It would tell you the nearest tube stop and the train that was coming that would take you to that stop. That's really all you needed. You didn't need a map of the tube, you didn't need all the other information that was on their website. They really understood who their users were, they made the app very simple, and they embraced the constraint of that mobile device. The fourth principle is using data as our guide. We all love to talk about data-oriented, and we all design these beautiful vistas and the beautiful products. This is a metaphor for what an architect would design when they're designing a garden. It's like, oh, we'll have this really nice path along the grassy road, it will go through these really nice redwood grove, and people will enjoy and stroll through it. But in real life, when this is opened up, what happens? The user is like, I don't really care about the trees. Okay? I'm going to take this shortcut right here. How many times have we built products with all these whiz bang features, and we find nobody uses them? Users just want to go from point A to point B. And if we are not careful, we try to put roadblocks. We'll put a do not enter sign there. Like, no, 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 we built all these great features for you here. Come look here. Why don't you do all this? Maybe we'll build one more feature and you'll love this even more. Wrong attitude. Thinking about the data actually enables you to build something that a user would really use. Take, for example, an analysis we did of how users use the LinkedIn homepage. What we found was they clicked on the feed a lot more if they had more connections. Kind of intuitive. Because if you have more connections on LinkedIn, you would have a lot more interesting stuff happening in your feed. And when you did that, you would click on it and you'd consume it more. But there was the following conundrum. When a user first joins LinkedIn, they either have zero or one connections. Because they either join on their own accord because they were looking up somebody, or they joined because they were accepting someone's connection request. So what happens? We could either push them to continue building their network, but they haven't really understood the value of LinkedIn yet, or what we did, and this has completely changed what LinkedIn has become, is it's gone from a just a networking site to also a professional content site. We said, what else do professionals need, whether they are connected to somebody or not? And it's information and news about what's going on in their profession. So that became the foundation of the LinkedIn content strategy in 2011. And today, on the backs of that strategy, LinkedIn is a top 25 global site, according to Comscore. The fifth, and perhaps the most controversial principle, is that innovation is not instant. And whenever I say this, the first counterexample, and we all love to argue, right, as engineers. As Vinod said, we like to be technically correct. So people would give me a counterexample. They say, what about the iPhone? What about the Android phone that you worked on? 
Those were amazing innovations. They were step changes into what happened. And I say, okay, that's true. Let's deconstruct it. What was amazing about those devices? And the first thing that people say is what? It's touch screen. Oh yeah. Remember the Palm Pilot? That had an amazing touch screen. You could do a lot of touch stuff, device stuff on it. it wasn't very successful, but it was great technology. Oh, but the iPhone is so beautiful, so glamorous, so sexy, you want to own it. You want to pay extra for it. Remember the Razer? The Motorola Razer was one of the first beautifully designed. It really took industrial design and put it at the forefront of consumer technology. People would take it out of their pockets and their purses and put it in restaurants on the tables to say, I have the silver Razer, what do you got? Oh, that's an LG black phone, yes, loser. What about email? What about communication? Well, we all know to hate the BlackBerry, but it did email and communication really, really well. Finally, music. It was more than just a communication device. The iPod, Apple invented that, but back in the 90s, there was a device called the Diamond Rio player. It was the very first solid state MP3 player. It did really well amongst the geeks. The beauty and the genius of folks like Steve Jobs is that they see these innovations and they package them and they integrate them so well so that eventually we as the world, what we see as a step change is really a bunch of small steps along the way. As I like to say, it takes multiple lead bullets to get to that one silver bullet in your products. And we should never lose sight of that. Number six is being flexible. Now this is a word that we hear about a lot in the Valley, and there are tons of examples of that, right? You have companies like Netflix, PayPal, Flickr, YouTube, that, are all, that have all pivoted. And the three examples I have here, they pivoted very early in their life cycle. Hard to do, but not impossible. We hear that a lot. But there's the one company, Netflix, that 10 years into its lifespan, after being a successful company, decided to pivot before it was necessary. That takes real courage. That takes doing what is not expected of you. And they are moving one step further. They are going from just broadcasting and going over the air to becoming a media house. The final principle is expecting success. This, by the way, is the hardest one. It's not technical, it is intrinsic. It's what's inside us. When we start our companies, when we build our products, they are like these little tiny plants. They need a lot of nurturing, love and care. But 95% of them, they disappear. They don't even grow and become an oak tree or a maple tree, something that will survive as a reasonable solid company. So if that is the case, how can we be envisioning this company, the small plant, to become something like a giant redwood tree, a species of trees that is indigenous to Northern California. They live over three to 400 years. They grow over 1,000 feet tall. You can have multiple forest fires and these redwood trees are not destroyed. Everything else around them can be destroyed. They are those iconic companies. They are the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Apples, the LinkedIn's of the world that will survive the test of time. But how does that work? How does it happen? There's a story about Larry Page and John Doerr talking in the early days of Google, when Google was probably between the small plant and this you know, oak tree. It was a small sapling. And John asked Larry, he said, what's your vision for the company? Where do you think we go? And Larry didn't hesitate. He said, 10 billion. John kind of stopped and said, oh, 10 billion market cap? Nah, I think we can get there. I mean, remember, this was in the early 2000s. Not that easy. And Larry said, no, not 10 billion in market cap, 10 billion in revenue. 10 billion in revenue. There aren't that many software companies that do that. And Google just finished their last quarter at 16 billion. You have to believe in your manifest destiny of success to be able to dream that big and to engineer your system so that you can handle that 100x growth. 
And there are very few entrepreneurs who think like that, who have that vision and who do it. But the ones who do, they are the ones who end up being inspired by innovation, by reinventing the companies and the products and the offerings, and ultimately creating something that's everlasting. 95% of technology companies do not last past 20 years. This is data from the NASDAQ. And I'm not talking about pets.com here. I'm talking about iconic companies, category creating and defining companies like Netscape, like Silicon Graphics. To be in the 5% club, we have to really pull ourselves back, take the risks that no one else has taken, think about our users, and ultimately believe in our manifest destiny of success. Thank you. That was so fascinating. I had a hard time getting you to stop. But there are a number of trending questions, and one of them is really stacking the deck, I think. And since you're speaking about apps and innovation, what are your views on the IIT GLC app done by our networking team? <laughs> uh, I haven't given my rating on it yet, so once I give my rating, I can tell you what it is. OK. How would LinkedIn's go-to-market go strategy change if it were launched today? Um, you know, clearly, when LinkedIn started, and many people don't know this, the company has been around since 2003, so it was formed two years before Facebook. And at that time, it was you know, built on web technologies that were known at that time. So it was an Oracle Sun shop. We were building everything for the web. And obviously, today, the first thing that would change is it would be built all for mobile. Okay. Are there any industries that you think will be disrupted by simplifying the UX? There are tons. Uh, uh, you know, I think that one of the things that gets in our way is the fact that all of us love to build. And human nature is that we want to be able to point to something we did, not something we didn't do. So taking features away and taking things out of things that are working is anathema to us. It's a cognitive dissonant thing. So just about anything we look around us could be made better and simpler. People do this in manufacturing all the time, right? You pre and M studies, and you look at things that are bottlenecks, and you change them, you streamline, streamline them. Um, you know, going back to this morning, what Elizabeth was talking about in the medical field and just in testing, why is it that we have to go to, you know, some place at seven in the morning after having done our appointments, wait for half an hour, have them draw three thimblefuls of blood, send it somewhere else, and then don't even know what happened with our own fluids from our own body. It goes to a doctor. And some nurse calls and says, everything's OK. Yeah. That's you know, complexity where complexity is not necessary. So if I can walk into my Walgreens, give them a pinprick of my blood, and comes back and gives me all this, you know, my profile and everything that's going on, that's simplicity. But there are so many such examples. Fabulous. Well, we've run out of time, but we've been trending a ton of zillion questions. Let's give it up for Deep. Thank you. Okay.